help me walk another mile Just one more mile I'm tired of walking on my own Just one more smile I know I can't make it On my own Come down From your golden trunk to me The touch of your tender hand Remove the shades of darkness And let me see Lord, let me see Just where I fit into your master plan It seems 
looks like trouble could be here to stay. Oh, but look who is standing here, my friend. He's going to help you find your way. Oh, it's God's only son. Jesus has come to give you the victory today. How long, how long, how long, how long till I reach the end of this valley? How long, how long, how long, how long till I see a triumphant song? Although my tears may endure for a night, joy will come in the morning.
is on a quest, seeking a sense of purpose and direction. We constantly pursue aspirations, fight battles, and sometimes feel utterly in despair. We journey through the path of life, searching for the thing that will truly transform us. We come not by marriage, we come by grace. There is a thirst, a desperate thirst for long-lasting peace. That same Jesus, the deliverer, the same yesterday, and the same in Douala, Cameroon. Here. This is the answer, an unchanging truth that dispels the chaos in our ever-changing world. My vision for Cameroon is uh, for a united nation, a peaceful nation, a progressive nation. And if we believe that together, we ask the Lord, and the Lord is going to do it in our country. Amen. Hop on the flight to Camtel Field, Bepanda, Douala, Cameroon, as we encounter the transforming touch of the unchangeable Christ. From the 23rd to the 28th, May 2024, at 1600 hours GMT, every evening, and on Sunday at 0700 hours GMT, with Pastor Dr. W.F. Kumui. As we journey from the East Nigeria to Central Africa, the swift yet life-changing touch of Christ is set to cause a transfiguration shift in ministries and in the lives of men. At the Ministers, Professionals and Believers Conference, themed Growing in Grace for Greater Impact in Ministry, come with an open mind. Be expectant of the place Christ has designed to take you to. For every youth in the grass to grace era, this is the final stop. The theme of the testimony is now from grace to glory. Tap into reality by registering your presence at Impact Academy May edition. Jesus knows the name of everyone. I'm glad he knows my name. The Lord will put a testimony in your mouth. In Christ, everything changes. Be a part of this divine experience. Don't be told. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. You see the mistakes of many. They confess sin. They don't confess Christ, the Savior, the Redeemer, the one who has died for us. They have conviction about their sin, about their guilt, about their condemnation. They do not have conviction about the Christ who died and about the Christ who was nailed to the cross and who took away all our sin. Whosoever, those who have been deep in sin, high in sin, those who have gone far in sin, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, there are some people that even wonder all these crusades we are having. And then we say, you want to receive the Lord as your personal Savior. Stand up there and raise up your hand. And then we say, come to Christ. And they don't cry. They don't roll on the ground. They don't feel sorry. They don't bring the remembrance of all the sins they committed from when they were very young until this time. They just stand up there and they say, Yes, Lord, I give you my heart and I confess that now you are my Savior. And then the preacher assures them, You have called upon the name of the Lord. You are saved. You are born again. Because whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, Lord shall be saved and some people say uh, is that salvation can people get saved like that thank God for the testimonies we are hearing the people that their lives have been transformed and righteousness came into their lives because they confess Christ is now my savior he died for me on the cross of calvary i have the joy of salvation i have the victory in salvation i have called and the word says and i believe it it's for the heart man believeth unto righteousness not by struggling 
not by trying, not by turning over a new leaf the way you have righteousness. Everything is hinged on Christ. Becoming a believer, a Christian, an heir of the promise of God, a saved soul, hinged on Christ. Receiving the blessings of Abraham and being counted a member of the family of God with real conviction, confirmation, and assurance based on Christ. We are justified, we are saved, we are forgiven, we are redeemed through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the sacrifice of Christ, the provision of Christ. It is what Christ has done on your behalf, on my behalf, on our behalf, and we believe that that gives us the freedom, the forgiveness, the salvation, the redemption, not the law of Moses, but the efficacy of the sacrifice of Christ. First John chapter 3, verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now, before we get to heaven, we have to be the sons of God here before we go to heaven. That's the only condition that we come to faith in Christ and then our lives are transformed and we are changed. Now, are we the sons of God? And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3, it says, and every Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. The Lord will put you. He'll purify you. And he will make your life what he taught to be as children of God by faith in Jesus' name. Rise up and tell the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. I come. Here I am. I know what the law could not do. Christ has come and Christ will do it in your life. Pray and believe by faith we enter in. We thank the Lord for another church given to us this evening through the mouth of the servant of God. The church has come revealing clearly to us the way of salvation, the scriptural way. And the servant of God has taken time to explain, and it's so clear. And we can see that from the scriptures, it is not by struggling, not by what people try to do, not by your rituals, not by your sacrifice, not anything. You may have been in this church for quite some time, and the, the, the word salvation sounds strange to you. All you just say, I've been in the church and the question is, when were you saved? When did you give your life to Christ? You cannot explain. Today's church reveals that Jesus died for the sins of humanity on the cross. He offered himself as an offering for the entire world, for all humanity. The plan and purpose of God is that men should be saved from their sins. And Jesus is the only one qualified to come and pay that supreme price. No other human being born of a woman was qualified to do it. Jesus came and he died on the cross. He shed his blood. It's the blood of Jesus that has the power to wash away our sins. Like the songwriter says, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, precious blood, powerful blood, the blood that flows down from Emmanuel's vein. Tonight, you can be saved right there where you are standing. Just tell the Lord you are sorry for your sins. That's all you need to say. And then confess Christ as your Lord and Savior. Ask him to come into your life and save you. The Lord will do and for us as gospelers and people of God, laborers in God's vineyard, preachers and evangelists, as we go out, as we preach to people, we give them the same assurance that if they shall believe in their heart and confess 
with their mouth. Confess with their mouth. That is the most important. Not how long they confess sin. Confess Christ as Lord and as King to come into their life. We give them that assurance that right there where they are seated, where they are standing, as they open up to God, through that godly sorrow for sin, they can be saved. And the Lord will save them. And the Lord will do it so clear, so definite, and it will be a beautiful experience. That's what we are to tell them. There is no long story. What the Lord could not do, Jesus did it because he alone has the power. And thank God for those who are saved, they will say that I surrendered, I confess, and I accept Christ as Lord and Savior, and he saved me. We thank God for that. And please, as we pray, let's all remember that the GCK is coming up next week in Douala, Cameroon. The May edition, we are to go out, publicize the crusade, invite people, men and women, boys and girls, young and old, and bring them to the nearest location where the crusade will be holding, so that they will have the opportunity to hear the word of God and be saved. Let's also pray for God's servant, that the Lord will use him under his mighty anointing to declare the word and souls will be saved. We pray together now. Father, we thank you very much for the charge you've given us tonight, a blessed charge, profitable to all men who will receive your goodness and your sacrifice for their lives and come into the kingdom. Lord, we pray you bless your servant and use him, O God, for this May edition of the Global Crusade in Douala, Cameroon, to the praise and glory of your name. We thank you, Father, because we know you have answered us. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Give me an headquarters. Say amen. amen. Father, we thank you. We love you. We, we glorify you. We adore you. What a great God, a good God, a gracious God you are. That you give us opportunity to listen to you directly by your spirit revealing the scriptures unto us. We are praying that tonight your word will come afresh to everyone in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that you grant us the grace and the strength to earnestly contain for the faith once delivered unto the saints in Jesus' name. That at this hour, at this time, at all these many years, we will not compromise the faith. We will not let down the faith, but in life, in action, in interaction, in our families, and everywhere we are, we will earnestly, positively, passionately contend for this faith in Jesus' name. We'll live for the Lord. We'll act in faith. And Lord, our lives will be glorifying unto you and bringing many people into the faith in Jesus' name. The entrance of your word brings light. And we're praying that today you enlighten us to understand the word of God in Jesus' name. Impact in our lives. Result in our lives that the word will bear fruit in every life in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. The Lord has blessed you. You can sit down. We're continuing our study of the epistle general of James. And now we come to James chapter 1 verse 9. In James chapter 1 verse 9, it says, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Look at verse 10. It says, but the rich in that he is made low because at the flower of the grass 
he shall pass away verse 11 and it says for the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat but it withereth the grass and the flower thereof falleth and the grace the goodness the beauty of the fashion of each passeth so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways verse 12 blessed is the man that endureth temptation for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life which the lord has promised to them that love him those are the verses we're looking at today the topic is the present permanent and perpetual exaltation of truly consecrated believers believers are those who are saved believers are those who have given their heart their life unto the lord believers are the people that have unreservedly absolutely completely without any other thought they have surrendered unto the lord they've repented of their sins all their sins they are not keeping any sin in them and they are not practicing any sin in the secret but they have committed and given themselves unto the lord in total repentance in true repentance in scriptural repentance and they have believed on the lord jesus christ to wash away all those things to forgive them all those things and to lean upon the lord and live for the lord in the grace of the lord every time believers these believers are so committed to the lord day and night and every day of the week every week of the month every month of the year there is no moment they go back from the lord they're consecrated to the lord they're committed to the lord and they're giving to the lord wholeheartedly that they will listen to him they will learn from him and they will do whatever he teaches them to do they don't have a double life they're not living like you know Sunday there's sunshine and during the week there is weakness no but all the days they live consistently consecratedly committedly unto the Lord and there is uh, nothing in them contrary to the faith they possess says these are consistent christians these are committed christians and these are consecrated believers they have a present and a permanent and a perpetual exaltation that god has promised them and that promise will be yours in jesus name and so the topic tonight the present permanent and perpetual exaltation of truly consecrated believers we're looking at three things here number one the present placement of temporal blessings in these end times number two the profitable perseverance of the believers while enduring temptations number three the promised price the promised crown, the promised reward for tried beneficiaries in endless triumph. Let's look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the present placement of temporal blessings in these end times. And let's go back to that again in James chapter 1 verse 9. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Verse 10, it says, But let the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. Verse 11, it says, For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace, the goodness, the beauty uh, of the of the fashion of it passes, so also shall the rich man fade away 
in his ways. We told him, First Timothy chapter 4, and we're reading there from verse 1. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. They will no more be earnestly contending, positively contending, practically contending. They will no more be passionately contending for the faith. In the last days, some things will bring discouragement to people or they will be sidetracked to other issues, to other things that they are no more giving themselves to lifting up that faith, expanding that faith and extending that faith to other people. They will go back from the faith. They depart and from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it said they will be speaking lies in hypocrisy and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And that means there, there are believers who are standing. There are believers who are steadfast. There are believers who keep to the way the Lord has given. There are some other people, uh, they, they were believers, and they still think they are believers, but they have departed from the faith. They, 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 they are people, uh, they now pursue material things. They are pursuing the riches of the world. And it says those people, they will fade away way like the grass the flower that fades away but we who know the Lord and love the Lord and keep to the Lord we have this present placement even of temporary blessings in these end times we're looking at three things here number one the wealth and promotion of the godly. Number two, the withering and passing away of the grass. Number three, the wastage and the perishing of their goodliness, of their fashion, of their beauty, of the things they are concentrating upon now. The goodness, the beauty, and the, and the splendor will pass away. Look at number one. Number one, the wealth and promotion of the godly. The wealth and the promotion of the godly. If you are godly, that means the grace of God has come to your life. That means you are a brother. That means you are a sister. That means you are a member of the family of God. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. We're told in Romans chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 14. The brother of low degree, he may not have too much of the things or count of the things that are tangible here in the world, but look at him now in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led of the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. He has the Holy Ghost leading him. He has the Holy Spirit abiding in him. He has the Holy Spirit guiding and leading and teaching and instructing. What a great privilege he has, the godly person. That's the promotion we're talking about. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, it says, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again to fear. You see that person that is called a brother and it says it's of low degree and the reason it says it should rejoice is he has not received the spirit of bondage the spirit that binds the people of the world and binds them to material things and binds them to material gain and binds them only to the earth and they are working for the dust and they are working for sand and they are not looking at the things in heaven but these people they don't have the fear of the people of the world but he have received the spirit of adoption that's the reason why why it says the lowly brother, the lowly sister, the lowly child of God is exalted that he has received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Look at verse 16. In verse 16 it says the spirit himself 
beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And because we are children of God, we can ask, we can seek, we can knock, and whatever we need will be given unto us. We may not have it in hand, but we have it in the bank of heaven. We have it in the presence of God in heaven, who is our Father. And He says, because now we're children. And the Spirit of God assuring us that we are the children of God and bearing witness with our heart that we're children of God, we ask, we receive. We seek, we find, we knock, the door is opened unto us for your father, knowing that ye have need of all these things. All we need to do is seek him for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Because these are the things the Gentiles are seeking, and the Gentiles concentrate on just that the material things but we are concentrating on the kingdom of God in heaven and everything we need is given unto us that's why it says the lowly brother appears lowly on earth but everything he needs is actually provided because of that he can rejoice look at verse 17 in verse 17 and if children then heirs heirs of God heirs Heirs of God, because now the wealth of heaven belongs to us and our portion he is the Lord himself. All the things of this world that the most of the world and everything can destroy, all that will leave their toys for them. Ours is the wealth that no moth or wrath can destroy and because of that we appear to be brothers sisters members of the family of god lowly but actually we are promoted and everything the lord knows you have will come your way will come my way and it says each children then ears ears of god and join each ears with Christ. If so be that ye suffer with him, that ye may also be glorified together. Suffer with him, persecution. Suffer with him, misunderstanding. Suffer with him, misrepresentation. But we're going to be glorified. Therein lies the wealth and the promotion of the Godhead. Look at number two there. Number two. Is the withering and the passing away of grass. It says in James chapter 1 verse 10, it says, But the rich, the rich without God, the rich without grace, the rich without godliness, the rich that only has the goodliness of the world that is just like grass, the rich that only depends on things on earth, all he has, all he knows, all is done is for the world. And this world passes away, and the loss thereof, and the glory thereof, but only those that do the will of God will abide forever. But the rich in that he is made low because at the flower of the grass he shall pass away. And look at this. We're looking at um, uh, Psalm 103. We're reading from verse 15. In Psalm 103, verse 15, as for man, his days are as grass. You see that? As for man, his days are as grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. And then verse 16. Verse 16 says, For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone. The wind passeth over it, and it is gone. Then the Lord gives us light. 
He gives us understanding. He gives us enlightenment because the people who don't have the light and the people who are not in the light, they're totally in darkness. They do not understand that man's life so brief like the grass of the field. The people that do not have the light, they're the people that are limited in their understanding. Everything they do, everything they think, everything they run after is only of this world because they are in darkness. But the Lord gives us light to understand that the wind passes over the grass and it is gone and the place thereof shall know him no more. Shall know it no more. That's the reason we come to the Lord and we love the Lord with all our heart, all our soul and all our mind and because we're not concentrating on the things only in this life in First John chapter 2. Reading here from verse 15. First John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world. Don't concentrate on the world. And don't glue your eyes, your mind, your gaze on the world. Don't give yourself to the world. When you say you have given yourself to the Lord, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, the things that are in the world, the wealth of the world, the riches of the world, the possessions of the world, the sand and dust of the world, the grass of the world, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. It says, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Verse 16, in verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, what makes them proud? Paper certificate, the pride of life. What makes them proud? The mode of transportation that they have. What makes them proud? The energy, the strength, physical, the thing they have, which is there today and is not there tomorrow. The position they have, the authority, human authority that they have, the thing that is all, and they don't have heaven. They don't have salvation. They don't have the spirit of God bearing witness with their hearts. The children of God. The things they have that makes them proud. The pride of this life. They are not of the Father, but is of the world. In verse 17, it says, And the world passeth away. Like the grass, the world passeth away like the goodliness of the things on earth the world passeth away like the things the people give their hearts they give their mind they give all their attention to the world passeth away like the possessions of the world is there now if the next minute is blown away the world passeth away but he the Doeth the will of God abideth forever. I will abide forever. When all the things of this world, when they have all gone, because actually, when we leave at a time of burial, they will not bury the account book with any of us. They will not bury all the money we stopped in the banks they don't bury them with us all the houses and all the properties and everything like grass that fadeth away did not bury anything with us will go but if we have salvation if we have the faith in the Lord, if we have the confidence, we have lived for the Lord and we're expecting the crown of righteousness, then we go and we rejoice forever and we abide forever. We'll abide forever in Jesus' name. Look at number three here. Number three, the wastage and the perishing 
of their goodliness. The wastage. How many people waste their lives? The wastage. How many people waste their beauty? The wastage. How many people waste their time? Their talent. How many people waste all their effort, all their ability? The wastage and the passing away of their goodliness. That's why it says in James chapter 1, verse 11, it says, For the sun is no sooner risen, but a burning heat, but it withers the grass. All the things that you know, the, the, the store in a secret place, and they say, I'm going to enjoy that for many years to come. All of a sudden, death knocks at their door. As they are saying, my soul, take your ease, eat, and drink. Because he had so much possession. Then the Lord said, thou fool, this night your soul will be required of you and whose will all these things be that you have gathered together so you see that is rich in the things of this world and is not rich in grace it's not rich towards god it's not rich in godliness all he has all he can point to is the grass that fadeth away and it says for the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat but it withereth the grass and the flower thereof falleth and the grace the goodness and the beauty and the pleasure of the fashion of it perishes so also shall the rich man the rich man who does not know God, the rich man has position on earth, does not have a place in heaven. So shall also the rich man fade away in his ways. I pray you will not be like that. I will not be like that. And look at Luke chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 16, Luke chapter 12. Verse 16, and he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. Plentifully. That's what hinders some people. They cannot come to study the Bible with us once a week like this, because the ground of that rich man has brought forth plentifully that's what happens to some people they've got one degree they, they, they are running for another degree they've got one doctorate they're running for another doctorate that's why they cannot study the bible the ground of a rich man brought forth plentifully that's why some people cannot give themselves to learning the word of god because they have an award here they have another award there and people are calling them here and all that they're running after all those things are like the grass that fades away and when death comes and when the unexpected comes they leave all those things and they go to a lost eternity look at verse 17 in verse 17 and he thought within himself saying what shall i do because i have no room where to bestow my fruits the fruits are so many the fruits of learning the fruits of working the fruit of earning the fruit of amassing and the food of just gathering and gathering and gathering they have no time they can reach a hundred books in a year they have a goal i read two books every week and i you know i have to do that i read on business i read on finance i read on human relationships i read on this i read on that they have no time to read the one single book that will determine their destiny. The one single book that will pave way for them in eternity. But they read and read and read. They labor and labor. They study and study. They work and they work. And there is no time to do the work that the Lord will reward them for in eternity. All the work they're doing is what will perish at the end of their day. And he thought within himself, saying, 
what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits look at verse 18 in verse 18 then he said this will I do is a man of planning it's not planning for heaven is planning for the harvest on earth. It's a man of uh, thinking. He's not thinking of heaven. He's thinking of what he has here on earth. It's a man of uh, activity, a purposeful activity. But the purpose is only for the things of this world. Think about your life. What do you plan for? What do you aim at? What are you running after? And what do you spend your night thinking and working on? Well, all those things might be good temporarily. Are you thinking about heaven? Are you thinking about holiness? Are you thinking about the grace of God that should increase in your life and take you on to heaven when you die? This man had no thought of grace, no thought of God, no thought of godliness, and no thought of going to the great beyond to be with the Lord when he dies. He says, this will I do. I will pull down my pants and build greater i'll get you know better engineers that constructed this other one and now we're going to have a better place to store everything that i'm there will i bestow all my fruits and my goods then in verse 19 and i will say to my soul he knew that he had a soul but he didn't make any room for that soul, any forgiveness for that soul, any salvation for that soul, any cleansing for that soul, any preparation for that soul to be with God in eternity. All he could say to the soul, I have these material things. Now look at what he said. He said, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Man, how do you know you have many years? I have a health plan. I do medical tests every time. And I make sure that I am fit. And whatever, I tell them the money is there. And whatever health I need you people, put your heads together. And put your research together. And give me the most modern uh, solution to my health challenge. And because he thought he had everything made, he said, I have much goods. But laid off for many years, take thine ease each day drink and be merry verse 20 now god has the final say i was waiting for an amen there amen. on the people of the world god has the final say on the people who think is there god is there no god never mind god has the final say on the people who kill themselves on projects 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 god has the final say on the people who are running and running after the things of this world god has the final say on the thoughtless they are not thinking where would they spend eternity god has the final say but God said unto him thou fool this night he was thinking of many years this night thy soul shall be required of thee then who shall those things be which thou hast provided look at verse 21 in verse 21 so is he that lays up treasure for himself, for himself, for himself. And there are some so-called believers too. They don't think of the Bible. They learn doctrine. The doctrine is in the head. It doesn't come to the heart. They're stacking away money. Money here in their country. 
money there overseas money everywhere and there is need there's need of preaching the gospel there's need of helping your neighbor there is need of be whatever needs to be done so that more souls will come into the kingdom uh -uh. they don't think of that money 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 they stack it away over there and the thing is uh, growing and expanding and they don't think they don't think, even those who are getting older and older and older, they don't think that when death comes, they leave all those riches suddenly. And whose will those things be that they are provided for themselves? They're not rich towards God. There are people, they hear about the rapture. The rapture can take place and you say, give me the next word. They say, anytime. They know that in their head. They don't know that in their heart. All the money you stack in all the banks and everywhere, you will not touch it. Even when your wife is sick, you will not touch it. Even when the children need this and that, you want that thing to reach a million. I want to be a millionaire. You want that thing to reach a billion. I want to be a billionaire. If Christ comes at any time, if the rapture takes place at any time, you're not going to take the billions away to heaven if you're able to make it at all because you will not take it away. When the rapture comes at any time, who will spend it? It will be in the hand of the Antichrist after you are gone. If you go, if you don't go, if the rapture takes place and you remain here, all that money is there in the bank, it's there everywhere. I store it and I take shares, shares there, shares there. If you don't make the rapture, even that money you cannot spend freely because you have to take the mark of the Antichrist before you can buy or sell. And if you take the mark of the Antichrist, with all your money, whatever you buy, whatever you sell, you're doomed and damned and condemned forever. This is the reason we need to think and we need to understand that the goodness of the rich people, if they don't have God, if they are God and they forget God and they are running after riches, so is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. We're coming to point number two here. Point number two, the profitable perseverance of believers while enduring temptations. We're looking at James chapter 1. We're looking at verse 12, first part of verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Blessed is the man that receives temptation. Blessed is the man that still stands firm and still holds himself up over under the pressure of temptation. We're looking at three things here. Number one, resisting the tempter with the sword of the world. Number two, refusing appealing temptations in supplication with willingness. Number three, rejecting attractive temptations with the steadfastness of the warrior. Look at number one. Number one, resisting the tempter with the sword of the world. The devil is the tempter and he was so audacious that he could even come to Christ and tempt Christ. And he, a tempter, the tempter, will tempt Christ. We Christians, who do we think we are, that the devil will not tempt us, no matter how high, no matter how much exposed, no matter how intelligent, and no matter how strong you think you are, if Christ was tempted, you cannot escape being tempted. But God give you the grace to say no. God give me the grace to say no. They give us the grace in Jesus' name. 
He tempted Eve and tempted Adam. And if he was so courageous, so daring to test the first man that did not have seen in his life, the first woman that did not have seen in her nature, if he was so daring, how do we think that today he'll just leave us alone? It's the tempter, and he doesn't have respect or honor for anyone. He brings temptation, and it is ours to understand temptation will come. It may not come in the direction you are thinking. So if you're looking at one direction, Satan, the tempter, does not concentrate only on one direction in temptation. He has a thousand and one ways in which he brings temptation. And it is ours to understand that the grace of God is available. Whatever direction it comes from, you will overcome. We're looking at Matthew chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, he calls him by the right title. The tempter is the devil, is Satan, is Lucifer, is the prince of this world, is the god of this world. Now he came as a tempter. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. The Lord Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. He was now hungry. The devil will bring temptation from the direction of what you are hungry for. If you are hungry for power, he will bring temptation that way. If you are hungry for position, he'll bring temptation from that way. If you are hungry for money, he'll bring your temptation that way. If you are hungry for the pleasure of the flesh, he'll bring temptation that way. If you are hungry for popularity, he'll bring temptation from that area. If you are hungry for knowledge, 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 and you are crying after the knowledge of this world, world he'll bring the temptation from that area and when he came he said if thou be the son of god command that these stones be made bread look at verse 4 in verse 4 but he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeded forth out of the mouth of God. When you know the word and you know that you live by the word, the word of promise, you live by that word. The word of power, you live by that word. The word of prophecy, you live by that word. The word of his proclamation, you live by that word. When you live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, you can easily throw the sword at the tempter. He'll flee away from you in Jesus name. We're looking at verse 5 in verse 5 then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple. Verse 6 in verse 6 and said unto him if thou be the son of God cast thyself down for it is written okay and Jesus quoted the Bible at him and he said, I know the Bible too. Satan knows the Bible. Although he will twist it, he will turn it upside down, he will take something out of the word, he will add something to the word. And if you don't know the word in reality, he'll easily deceive you. It's just like sometimes you meet some of these people outside and they're not born again, but they can quote the Bible, although they quote it wrongly, but they still quote the Bible. The tempters and the followers of the tempters in our places of work 
in our marketplace, in our community, even in our extended families. When they want us to do something and we're saying no, and they say, but why? The Bible says, and then they bring out a word, don't listen to them, don't be deceived because of their misquotation of the Bible. And so the devil said that for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Look at verse 7, verse 7, Jesus said, Unto him, understand, Jesus, the light of the world. He quotes the Bible from the angle of being the light of the world. And Satan is uh, the devil and is the prince of the power of darkness. He quotes the Bible from the angle of darkness. It's in darkness. He doesn't have grace. He doesn't have godliness. He doesn't have the gospel. All he can do is quote, you know, the Bible out of context, out in darkness. But because Jesus is the light, the light of the word came and Jesus said, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says again, the devil, he will not give up so quickly. If you overcome one temptation, don't think that is so, everything is finished now. No, you may come back again. Maybe that day, maybe another day, maybe another week, and he'll come from another angle. Again, the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Jesus will be the King of Kings. Amen. And the Lord of Lords, the kingdoms of this world will soon become the kingdom of our God and His Christ. Jesus knew all those things belonged to Him, but the devil wanted Him to take the kingdoms from Him the devil, not from the Father, God in heaven. Maybe there are some things that legitimately belong to you, and the Lord has promised you, and you know you are going to have, yes, you will have. You will have. But before that point of possession, the devil may come and offer it to you. Don't make the mistake and say, after all, the Lord has promised me, and I know it will be mine, and even if it comes from an idol worshiper, even if I have uh, to, you know, bow down to them before I have no problem. Uh, there's problem. There is problem. What God intends to give. You must not get from the devil. It says over here, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Look at the next verse, verse 9, and says unto him, all these things will I give thee if you're looking for, you know, prosperity at any cost, money at any cost, wife at any cost, children at any cost, property at any cost. If you want it so seriously and so definitely that you say I'll pay any price, you may pay the price with your soul with your eternity. You may pay that price with your destiny. The thing is, leave it in the hands of God and let God give at the time he wants to give. It says, and he said to him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Verse 10, in verse 10, then said Jesus unto him, 
get thee hence. Get out of my way. I thought you would say that. Get thee hence, Satan, for it is reaching. Jesus always arch the reaching one. And he knew that it will be accomplished as it has been reaching. It is reaching. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Amen. Yeah. You resist the devil, he will flee from you. We're looking at number two. Number two, we're looking at refusing appealing temptations in supplication with willingness. Supplication with willingness. Supplication is prayer. The willingness is really, you don't want to fall into that temptation. Really. You desire that the grace of God remain in your life and the pleasure of the flesh. The pleasure of things present will not cloud your vision, will not take heaven away from you. And so you have the willingness when you pray. If you are praying and God knows you don't have the willingness, you are wasting God's time. He will not allow you to waste his time. You are praying. You want to overcome. You are praying. You want to have the power to receive. You, you are praying. You want to be free from all the snares of the devil. If you are willing, it will be so. Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing because your spirit knows the consequence of falling into temptation. The spirit is willing because you're saved, you're born again, you've given yourself to the Lord. And the spirit says, isn't it a good thing to remain and abide as a member of the family of God? The spirit is willing. The spirit is willing. I'll make you officials of men. You know the promise you're given. And you know, if you're going to achieve, if you're going to possess the fulfillment of the promise, you you have to remain with him. The spirit is willing because you know without holiness no man shall see the Lord. But now the flesh is weak. The flesh is not, not at the same level as the spirit. The flesh desires these things that the flesh contacts in the world. The spirit is for heaven. But the flesh is looking for what is pleasing in the world. And because of that gap between the spirit and the flesh, that's why you are there in prayer. You see, the flesh must come to the same level, to the same position, to the same desire as my spirit. And when you do that, and your flesh comes to that same level, at the willing spirit, that's when you overcome easily. You will overcome. I will overcome. When we refuse those appealing temptations, we'll overcome in Jesus' name. Look at number three. Number three, we're looking at rejecting attractive temptations with steadfastness as a warrior, as a soldier. Because if we don't resist and if we don't act like a warrior, all those things may draw us. Look at Luke chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 13. Luke chapter 8, verse 13 day on the rock a day which when they hear receive the word of joy and these have no root which for a while believe for a while believe and then it says and in time of temptation they fall away 
for a while they believe and while they believe during that time they are not making their soul they are not making their mind to concentrate on the Lord and to be strengthened in the Lord and to prepare for the evil day of temptation that might come and when the temptation comes the jolly good christians they come to church they go back home everything is fine it's like they are walking in the air but now temptation comes suddenly and they do not have the roots they are not grounded so that they will overcome that will not happen to you. You will overcome in Jesus' name. He tells us in verse 14, in verse 14, and that which fell amongst us are they which when they have heard, they go forth and are choked with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. The people that do not get themselves grounded, established in the word, that they're just like here and there, and the winds can easily blow them off their feet, that because of the cares of this life, cares of this life, cares of this life, and the deceitfulness of riches. You know, there, somebody is bringing something to them. You know, this deal, this one will go through. This one is not like all those people that come to deceive you. This one, if you put in this amount, it will double. I'm telling you, in two weeks, you are going to have this. And because they have the deceitfulness of riches bugging them, they have the deceitfulness of riches following after them they fall into it and they lose everything they've got they gamble with everything they've got they might even gamble with their souls the prince of the power of the air sends his emissaries to them come into covenant if you come to this covenant you know in life this is where you'll be and that's what you'll be and because of the deceitfulness of their own ambition they fall into that they fall into temptation and then they realize they've sold their heart to the devil and then it says because of the pleasures of this life pleasures of this life would you be surprised some people that say they are born again the pleasures of drinking alcohol beer the pleasures of pornography that thing just interests them and they cannot go without the pleasures of this life the pleasures of drinking smoking something that will put them on high the pleasures of this life whatever the pleasure is because of that temptation they bear no fruit to perfection i pray it will not happen to you i look in at first timothy chapter 6 reading from verse 9 first timothy chapter 6 reading from verse 9 but they that will be rich the people that say i look at that person we came out of school the same year look at where he is and look at the kind of car he's riding because of that they say i will be rich look at this woman retired from office the same time what has she done? Why is she making it like this? Now, I'm going to concentrate quality time. I'm going to have what she has. Look at this professional person. And we came out of, you know, the professional training at the same time. Look at what they have. Look at what they are riding. And look at the places they can easily travel to. Whatever happens, I will be there. The people that will be rich, by all means, by whatever means, it says they fall into temptation and a snare. 
and into many foolish and hurtful laws which drown men in destruction and perdition. That's what drown. When somebody is in the river, too deep for his height, too wide for his strength, and too dangerous for his little wisdom, and he's drowning. And the people cannot come to hell because they do not know how to swim to the point they can help the drowning man. He drowns in the sea. He drowns in the ocean. His life comes to an end. And there are people, they are not drowning in the sea. They are drowning in destruction and perdition. They've gone so far, they've gone so low, they've gone so wide, they've got all these connections, they've committed themselves in their, in their pursuit of riches. And now, how can they come out? They've discovered they sin will lead to covenant of the devil with darkness and they have said I will give this if you give me this their life is already now given to the hands of the devil because they'll be rich by all means we're not only talking about people in the world we're talking about people even on the pulpit they want a large crowd and they want many people to be following after them. They want to have a name, a name on earth that that religious clergy, that Christian preacher is up there. And would you know how they go in secret? And then they sell their souls and they sell their future and they sell their destiny into the hands of the devil. Do it for me, do it for me, whatever, whatever. If we do it for you, you will die at this age. What does that matter? If I have what I'm looking for, give me something big that before I go, people will never stop talking about me. And because they want to be rich in uh, kind of uh, you know profession of religion and so they sell themselves they drown they drown in perdition and destruction look at verse 10 verse 10 for the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after they have edged from the faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows it will not happen to you. It must not happen to you. You're on your way to heaven. Don't be sidetracked. Looking here, looking there. How to get this, how to grab that. Heaven is enough for you. The glory of heaven. The beauty of heaven. The enjoyment of heaven. That's enough. Don't allow anything of this mundane world to sidetrack you you will not perish by the wayside we're coming to point number three here point number three the promised price the promised reward the promised crown for tried beneficiaries in endless triumph we're coming to uh, james chapter one we're reading from verse 12 blessed is the man that man is here tonight. That woman is here tonight. Blessed is the man that endure temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. The Lord has promised to us that love him will not miss it in Jesus name three things we're looking at number one reversing the cravings of thoughtless and trampled beasts there are beasts 
They are men, but their passion is like the passion of the beast. There are men or women, the desire, their drive is like the desire and the drive of the beast. We need to reverse that. By grace, you reverse it in Jesus' name. Number two, renewing the consecration of trusted and uh, tested believers. Number three, receiving the crown of the tried, triumphant bride. Number one, in number one, reversing the cravings of thoughtless, trampled beasts. In Jude chapter 1, only one chapter there, Jude 1, verse 10, but these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts. It's talking about people because it talks about speaking evil of those things they know not. And what they know naturally is talking about people as brute beasts. In those things, they corrupt themselves. The things they know, they corrupt themselves. The knowledge they have, they corrupt themselves. The experiences they have, they corrupt themselves. The contacts they have with the world, they corrupt themselves. The things they possess, they use them to corrupt themselves. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, woe unto them. For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gain saying of Corey. Look at verse 12. These are sports in your feasts of charity. They mingle, they mix with the people, children of God, charitable people of God. Born again, children of God, converted children of God, and the sanctified, holy children of God, they mingle in our midst, but they have another heart. They have another mind. And when they have the chance, they speak evil of leadership. They speak evil of the dignitaries. They speak evil of the things they know. And the ones they don't know, instead of saying, I don't know. They speak evil of those things. It says they go in the way of Cain, Korah, Balaam. And then it goes on to say there are spots in a feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are, without water, carried about of weeds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit twice dead, plucked up by roots. In verse 13, verse 13, reaching waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Have you found that somebody is supposed to be a believer? And then when he gets talking, foaming out uncontrollably, the dirty things in his heart, the suspicions in his heart, and the kind of corruption that is stored inside him. You see, hold it now, <laughs> be quiet now. It's senseless. He cannot control. Once he starts foaming out all those things, there's no end to it. Not born again. If he was born again before, he's now gone back. He's dead again in trespasses and in sins. Twice dead. He was dead. He became born again. He was quickened, saved. Then he backslid again, dead again the second time 
terrible, twice dead. No fruit, no joy, no evidence of salvation. Raging waves of the sea, the temper, the anger, the things that come out as their eyes bulge out in anger. You say, but it's supposed to be a Christian. It's supposed to be a believer. No. Grace gone completely. And it says, it's foaming out its own shame. And it's like wandering star to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. That will not be my portion. The Lord help all of us. Total change, transformation like great children of God. There's nothing to form out anymore. We don't have a religious satanic epilepsy. Those who have religious satanic epilepsy, those are the people that